Um, good morning, everyone. How is it going? Um, yes, taking a look at your faces. and um, You know, it's cool to be the first one speaking in the main conference because not only, well, not only because I will feel more relaxed and released after this and I will be able to enjoy the conference completely, but also because I see your faces full of enthusiasm and eagerness to learn new <laughs> concepts, new tools, new techniques. And that makes it much harder for me to say that I may disappoint you because I have not a lot of experience with this with presentation. So I met a guy uh, outside and he told me with this smile, you should always include demos in your presentation, always. They always work. And then he started laughing more, <laughs> and he just disappeared. So I, I, I thought it was a, like a very good advice. So that's what I'm gonna do. So that's me. And those are just a bunch of color lines that mean something that represents something. And I'm gonna just shut this down because it takes a lot of resources. But what have just happened here? Um, well, let's say that the laptop was like a black box that was reading input frames from the camera. And it was returning in also uh, some sort of skeletons uh, that represent the state of the people in the image. And by state, I mean like a more detailed information than just a bounding box. And this research field uh, is called human pose estimation. And human pose estimation has tons of application just imagine yourself uh, doing this to your window and your window you say okay I need to shut myself down and or just uh, put it in front of your computer or your smartphone and like train up new clothes instantly without having to go to the shop or just raising your hand to a self-driving taxi so it just stops and pick you up so uh, though it has tons of application, it wasn't seen as possible until a couple of years ago with the emergence of deep learning and the development of a uh, huge data set and well-defined data sets like the Coco data set. The Coco data set has like, Coco key points data set has like more than 200,000 images where each person is defined with not one body part or two, three, four, with 18 body parts. So how to solve this? Yes, it's like a lot of uh, convolutional uh, layers. Yes, keeping in mind that the output must be 18 matrices, where each matrix is a heat map in which it each pixel, uh, each pixel value represents the likelihood of that pixel of being an, a specific body part, like the eyes, the neck, etc. So uh, now there is a problem because if we have multiple people in the image, how do you know which part belongs to which person? So that's when that's where open pose comes in. Open pose is a deep learning model developed by the Carnegie Mellon University that is also open source that was not only trained with the team body parts, but also with the connections between them. Not only these 17 connections, but also two more that are weird with ears and the shoulder. 
And that means that after all, you're gonna see like the open post model is not only gonna output uh, 18 heat maps, one heat map per body part, but also uh, one, two new matrices for each connection, what they call part affinity fields. And these part affinity fields are just, they come in pairs because they not only tell you the likelihood of a pixel to be part of a connection, but also they tell you the direction in the X and Y um, axis. So for example, here we're seeing that this is like the connection uh, with the neck and the nose, and this connection is in the positive direction, so it is like higher, positive, and this goes in the negative direction of the x-axis. So it, it is like negative. We're gonna see this later. We're gonna understand it. But the thing is that we're gonna use these paths to uh, score each connection. So in the post-processing, we're gonna select the connections with higher score. And this works like magic. So what, what is the open, how, how is in a structure, the open post architecture? We have the, at first we have feature structure based on the BGG19, the 10 first uh, layers of the BGG19. And then these features just goes into a stage which has two levels. Because the first level is gonna output heat maps and the second level is gonna output the paths, the part affinity fields. And we can make it even more complex, uh, put in a new stage that is a more complex stage. And we can make it even more complex uh, repeating the second stage so having a third stage, or a fourth, fourth stage, or T stage. Can repeat it a lot of times. So, what, what does this mean, um, part of the dimension? What? One, two, three. Yes, this is the, like the, the kernel size. We have, uh, we have the three by three uh, kernel size convolutional, convolutional layer. One by one, seven by seven. So this is very more complex than this one. This has like more operations. Okay, so this is cool. This works, but it is useful. I I, I came. I come from from a robotics background, and if you show me this, I'm gonna say, okay, that's awesome. But can I use it? Can I use it in my robot? You could say, okay, yes, if you have a, like a GPU, like this big, <laughs> and that's gonna, that's not gonna fit in your robot, and also it's gonna like consume your battery in two seconds. Um, well, n th that's not all, only a problem for me, that's also a problem for Android developers, for example, who just have these resources. Okay, so, how can we just make this less expensive? How can, how can we uh, make it faster? What we have to do is to reduce operations. So let's make this faster. Okay, uh, the first thing here is that we can realize that that's a convolutional layer. That's another convolutional layer. That's another. They're all convolutional layers. That's a fully convolutional uh, network. So what that means is that we can select, we can choose uh, the input size of our image. So if we select an input size, uh, a tiny image, we're gonna have less um, operations than with a bigger image. If the image was bigger, the kernel had to slice it more time so it, it, it could just uh, need more operations. 
So that's the first thing. The second thing is that we have these stages. And it's not the same to select just two stages than seven stages. It's going to make a big difference. And the third one is like the, the trickier, the, uh, the trickiest, because we need to uh, change every uh, convolution, every standard convolution, into a depth-wise convolution. What, what does it mean? It means that in a, a standard convolution, you have a kernel that, it's, that just takes into account all the channels of the input tensor. But in a depth-wide convolution, you have uh, a kernel per channel. And that kernel is only cares about its specific channel. So its depth is just one. And then we just combine them all with a point-wise uh, convolution that is just a standard convolution, but one by one. And this is very important because it can reduce the, uh, the operations by almost k squared, with k is the uh, size of the depth-wise uh, kernel. Uh, bad news here is that we need to train the network again if we need if we want to uh, change from a standard to depth-wise convolution, and we had to thank uh, we had to be thankful to uh, this guy Il Joachim because he trained it for us, so it's that's very cool. And now that we have all the ingredients, yes, we can play with them. OK. So now, here, I'm going to use your Python notebooks not only because they're very cool and you know it, but uh, they can only, they make it possible to interact with some parameters that are uh, important here. And you know it's very cool uh, the interact widget in the Jupyter notebook. So I just load TensorFlow, and I load this to uh, uh, it, it. It will allow me to load all the graphs because they come in this frozen um, extension that makes it like lighter. That I'm loading here the open pose, the classic open pose graph, and now we're going to load the depth, the one with the depth wise uh, convolution. There is a, we can call it mobile net open pose. Now we combine all of them into dictionaries, and I have here like a bunch of helper functions for images. We're going to work with this image over here. There is 400 to 600. And now we are going to interact with it. OK, now it's loading. We're using the original open pose with four stages. And it has lasted like five seconds per frame. It's not useful, five seconds per frame. But we can see here that if I change the parts, the bar index, we're going to see how it changes. It is showing me the heat maps of every one of the, of the parts. We can uh, make this, we, we can also see this, the, the part affinity fields here. Th this is not. Here are the part affinity fields, and this is just one. We're going in the x direction, and if we go to here, we see like the image we we have seen before. Like this is positive because it's going in the positive direction of, of x, and this is negative because it's going in the negative direction of x. But the 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 two um, the two connections 
and are going up. Up is the opposite direction of, of y. And if we look at the y uh, path, we're going to see that those are both negative because they're pointing upwards. OK, that was the um, BGG. We can also go back to heat maps and just change the input the input size. This k factor is going to just reduce our input size so we can make it the input size of the image. So we can make it like half the uh, half the size and we're going to see like instead of 5 seconds it lasts like 1 um, one seconds and 60. Okay, but the accuracy is less than before. If we if we select a image that is 10 times smaller, we're going to see that it's much faster, but the accuracy is not useful. You know, I, I just can't know what you're doing here. So we need to go to uh, mobile net to this depth wise convolution to just yes, see uh, some useful um, so something useful it's like going crazy right now okay okay now we see it this is like 10 frames per second and this is maybe useful this may be useful. If we uh, make the image smaller, we're going to have uh, a s smaller inference time. That makes it even more useful. The implementation that I'm doing, that I, that I show you, I think it is with more stages, because it makes it more accurate. But it is still useful. Like train frames per second, it's not the more use the most useful, but it's useful. So um, let's go back here. And well, with these changes, we can make some useful application in applications in robotics. Like this is what I did in my bachelor thesis. The um, I use it not only to to produce to to output these skeletons, but also to estimate roughly the um, the three D position and three D orientation of the person uh, that, that the of the people that the robot sees. So this is like the robot that's me, and he just well, he just knows how where I am, where am I looking, and he just let's go is going down, going there to approach me. But it was useful, but not accurate, not very accurate. So looking at the state of the art, we, we can see that they're using uh, gangs to have, uh, to generate more data, more data that there is more accurate than 3D and can make something as cool as this just for hands or this uh, there is like the last week it, it came in the last week in which you have a source video in, in which the person is dancing you detect the pose and we you have an, a target video which this is not what in reality this girl is doing but it maps it some way with magic uh, so it's very cool and I'm gonna keep researching on this I didn't know I want to be a researcher until a couple of months ago so um, I may be late but if you have some advice or something I'm here and you can just uh, catch me up so that's all thank you
Can you maybe explain in a bit more detail how the depthwise convolution allows you to cut compute while retaining accuracy? Yeah. Okay. I have the document here. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yes, okay. Uh, mm, usually, you have uh, your standard convolution, your standard convolutional filters have this form. You just um, take into account all the channels in the input, in the input tensor. And, and that makes it that you have like this this um, um, this is the total of operation you use because you're having a multiplication in each slide. There is k by k by m, and then you slide it f time df times here and df times here for the input size, and you may have like n kernels. But with depth-wise convolution. Uh, the 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 result is that you your standard you what you do in the depth wise convolution is that you have instead of each kernel like takes into account the m input channels yes you have m kernels with each kernel yes takes into account one a specific uh, one specific channel. And that results in you having these um, you having these uh, operations that if we divide it by the standard uh, convolution operations, we have here that there, that this is the 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 comparison. And with n huge that it is with n is the number of filters you use with n when n is higher you just can uh, remove this term and just keep with this so um, I don't know if I explain it very clear because I don't want to extend if you if you have more doubts that I think you are, you have so you can just catch me later and I'm gonna explain you uh, as good as I can Running somewhere in some um, uh, setting where you have robots interacting with humans. Yes, well, th that's what I did in my bachelor thesis. I, I applied this into this uh, robot that is intended to uh, that is intended to live with elderly people, and the the goal was to not only uh, detect people and know what they're doing if they're also fall if this person has fallen you can detect it with with this but what uh, the goal also was is to uh, have an estimate of the position in the plane the position and orientation that you know where uh, where they are and also where they're looking where they're looking at you can estimate it like by by the length of the of the connections and that but it's not very accurate but it works and that's what we're doing in Universidad de Malaga so it's they're still working with him with it I'm just no longer in the in the project but but it's being used yes Questions? So, thank you.
Okay, so, so hello everyone, and uh, the title of my talk will be GMDH Neural Network for Short-Term Electricity Load Forecasting. So a couple of things about me. I'm a, an electrical engineer and the Greek transmission system operator, which is basically a company that manages the electrical uh, grid of Greece. It's like uh, Terna here in Italy. Uh, during the occasionally I put on a hat and I do some senior technical development editing work for Manning and my presentation here has nothing to do with the fact that they are sponsors of this conference so uh, my presentation uh, uh, consists basically of two parts in the per first part I will uh, present uh, briefly but I will go through this uh, conceptual overview of this particular uh, class of models and in the second part I will present a case study where we use uh, this model we apply this model to solve uh, the short-term load forecast electricity so what uh, this is uh, GMDH neural networks uh, the principle GMDH stands for group method of data handling it's uh, actually early work uh, based uh, from the 70s based in the work by professor Ivachnenko in the 70s so it's, uh, this uh, class of models is based on a simple principle. It says that uh, we can actually uh, approximate any continuous function by using an infinite series, the functional form of which you can see in the slide. And uh, this uh, series uh, consists of terms that are really interactions of our predictor variables. And uh, the question that was posed and answered by the same uh, people that uh, were doing this work was whether there is a possibility there is a way to approximate this and construct such a polynomial in an efficient manner in a clever way and it turns out that there is so this is really this type of neural network resembles a traditional a feed forward uh, architecture but uh, it is uh, constructed in a different manner so let's see how we go about in constructing such a, an architecture so we start with a set of inputs x1 to xm and then we add the first node in our hidden layer now this node is a partial model in itself so what this means is basically it takes only inputs from a pair of our inputs so this particular node it takes inputs from x1 and x2 and it constructs a polynomial description a polynomial approximation of the va variable that we of the target variable and uh, so what we do then is we add a second node and this node takes inputs from x1 and x3 and we continue the same process by taking all possible pairwise combinations of our inputs and for each of these combination we construct a hidden node now in order to continue constructing our layer, we keep on stacking more and more layers in, the sim in a similar fashion. The only difference being that uh, each layer that we add to our network takes inputs from the previous layer that was constructed. And uh, during this uh, learning process, it is very important to keep track of the best node, that is, of the partial model that was uh, the best that has the best prediction score on a validation set during the learning process this will uh, be used as a criterion to terminate our learning process so this is the general procedure so we start by creating a layer by taking all these uh, pairwise combinations into account then after having created this layer we train the nodes into the layer and we train by training, it doesn't have to do anything with the uh, backpropagation or what. We train each node separately. For each node, we estimate the coefficients of this quadratic node. After we have finished the training in this layer, we prune it. What do, you, what do we mean by pruning the layer? It means that before constructing a new layer, we don't want to keep all the nodes in the current layer. Rather, we use an external criterion to eliminate some of the nodes. So after we've done this, we have to ask a question. Have we achieved a, an have we achieved, have we improved by adding a layer? Has 
the best node in the uh, the best node in the current layer is it better than the global <coughs> best node if yes we continue construction of new layers if not we stop and designate the best node as the output node of the whole layer of the whole network so this is very easy to model from scratch in python really uh, the building block of this particular uh, uh, of this model is just a polynomial node and we have to keep track of the input nodes uh, it is good if we keep uh, we cast our predictions so that we don't have to uh, do intermediate computations during the learning process and this uh, implementation really only has three methods transfer which uh, takes the two input the two input variables of this particular node and uh, uh, creates a quadratic uh, feature matrix and then we also have a fit and predict method now the fit and predict method are not shown here because it turns out that since th this model is very flexible this uh, polynomial model is really a linear model so there are multiple ways to fit this model and one straightforward solution is to use ridge regression where we have to minimize a cost function which is really uh, consists of two terms the first term is the least squares the first term in this cost function is a least squares term and then we have a penalty term that is multiplied by a, a, a scalar alpha which is really dictates uh, how much uh, trade-off is between the two terms in this uh, cost function and it turns out that uh, it is possible to uh, obtain a closed form solution to this problem and we can solve this using a vanilla numpy or it is possible to use a scikit-learn and uh, in this case it is very convenient to use a grid search uh, cross-validation which is a meta estimator and this uh, will have its very handy uh, object to use because we pass it a one-dimensional grid of our hyperparameters and grid search CV will automatically execute multiple models and then uh, it will determine and uh, return to us the model uh, for uh, the optimal model and another way to fit a node is to use Bayesian linear regression in which case uh, we don't get point estimates of our coefficients but rather we get a posterior distrib distribution for uh, uh, estimates for our uh, parameters, for our model parameters. And it turns out uh, that in order to solve this problem, we can use a method called the vi variational inference. And the uh, variational inference is uh, like, I like to think of it as a politician. You ask a question and you get back an approximate answer. This is what variational inference does. You want a posterior distribution, it will give you a posterior, an approximation to this posterior distribution but an, a good approximation. Now, why I, I want to emphasize this method because it turns out that variational inference is becoming very important uh, in the current uh, deep learning uh, setting that we have and uh, more and more frameworks adapt uh, variational inference because, and the reason is that variational inference uh, differs from other approximation methods like for instance Markov chain Monte Carlo which is a sampling method in that it turns uh, the, the sampling uh, method into an optimization problem the sampling problem into an optimization problem and we can solve this optimization problem using all these uh, automated uh, uh, differentiation uh, tools available uh, on uh, in all these uh, deep learning frameworks so TensorFlow for instance has a there's a tensorflow underscore probability that has a module called, called Edward that supports Bayesian regression. It's becoming more and more important. Now this code, don't pay any attention to it. It's just for pedagogical uh, purposes. You can implement variational inference for linear regression by yourself. And the full derivation is chapter 10, pattern recognition in machine learning by Christopher Bishop. And the final way to fit a model is by using stochastic gradient descent. And this is possible to use very easily using TensorFlow. And now the model has some advantages and some disadvantages, of course. Now the advantages is that it's a very simple model to construct. And it's also very computationally efficient because that's 
as uh, each node is uh, trained separately to every, uh, in every layer. It's uh, trained independently of the other nodes. It's easy to parallelize. So I only have two minutes, so I will skip to the second part of the presentation, which is how can we use this? And it turns out, out that uh, there's a very important application that this uh, model can be used. It's uh, load forecasting. And what the load forecasting is that uh, in the, it turns out that in electricity energy industry, forecasting has become very important. And there are two reasons for that. The first reason is electricity markets. And there are many players that participate in electricity markets, and every pay player wants to optimize their position in this market setting. So they use some forecasting tools. And the other one is the penetration of uh, renewable sources that have uh, added a stochastic component into the grid. So from our perspective in my company that we manage the grid, we have an obligation in the context of electricity market. Every day we have to produce a schedule. And this schedule is a generating schedule for every unit, a generating unit that participates in this electricity market for the next 24 hours. Now, in order to produce this schedule, we solve an optimization problem, a constraint optimization problem. And this constraint optimization problem has some inputs and some constraints. One of these very important constraints is the so-called balancing energy constraint, which means that whatever energy for every hour of the day, whatever energy uh, is injected into the system by the generating units, have to be consumed. And uh, how do we know how much energy will be consumed? Well, we have to produce a short-term load forecast. And this is what we used as a proxy for the energy demand. Now, a poor energy forecast means that we have a suboptimal solution of this problem, and this has financial costs. So how do we approach this problem? Well, it's really a machine learning problem, so we typically follow the machine learning steps. And in this particular type of problem, it's very important to concentrate in steps three and four. We have to look at our data. This is a time series problem, and we, it is very important to have to look at our data. It's, I know that many ma machine learning pra pra practitioners are eager <coughs> to just run a machine learning model and then go to their boss and say, I have 1% prediction, now pay this big fat bonus that you promised. You will never achieve this without doing a very concise EDA. Now, what we are seeking to effect, or effectively forecast is something like this. This is actual load demand for one week, hourly. And so there are two times, <laughs> there are two ways to approach this problem, to solve a, a forecasting time series forecasting problem. We can either use some exogenous variables, like, uh, and in our case, uh, load uh, demand is uh, dictated by human behavior, and we cannot obviously directly quantify this. Uh, so we have to use some proxy variables, and uh, typically we use uh, weather variables as well as seasonal uh, variables. Another way to approach this problem is to use lagged values of the quantity to be forecasted, and this is the approach used in this problem. So we transform our univariate time series into a tabular structure and then we have to follow this similar procedure we have to partition our data set and we use indexing there to partition the data set because we have to maintain maintain the time order in the time series and then we scale using the training set and after running the model <coughs> we can this is what we get from a, this simple model so it's it's really quite decent to be honest and this is a multi-step prediction what it means is that occasionally in some blog posts and in the internet, you will see time series forecasting. And really, you will see the predictions almost coinciding with uh, the actual value that you want to predict. And I'm telling you, this is cheating. It's a one-step forecast. In reality, in m most situations, you are interested in multi-step forecast. So at a certain point in time, you want to predict for multiple time horizons ahead. And there are three ways to do that. And uh, in this case, we are using recursive, that means forecasting, me that means we predict a sequence by predicting the next value and then using this value and feed it back to our input and then 
Uh, we take the, the, the row with our previous prediction and predict the second ahead and so on. This uh, method has a disadvantage that errors are accumulated as the forecasting horizon increases. And so after running our model, this is our end model, you see. This is uh, one very nice feature of this particular class of models that uh, it's interpretable and we get a sparse model so all the red nodes are actually the ones of the, the inputs that are contributing to our final prediction. And uh, so we can uh, achieve this by backtracking from the output back to the input to get uh, all the active paths. And is it possible to, can we do better? Yes, there are multiple ways that we can improve our model. And thank you very much. <laughs> Since there's a time restriction, we'll probably take a couple of questions. Thank you for your talk. Um, do you take into consideration also meteorological data for your prediction yeah. for a, a, like a proxy a few hours of prediction of meteor? Yeah, in the okay, this is not a production model. We don't actually use this model in our premises. Instead, we have an ensemble of models that we use. And of course, we take into account uh, several weather uh, variables into account, like, for instance, uh, temperature, uh, cloud cover, uh, solar irradiation. Right. Okay. Yes, it is uh, very difficult just to predict. By w but we use time series models as well, and we produce an ensemble forecast. Any other question? Yes. Um, during the pruning process? Yes. Uh, uh, it's a heuristic, basically, and uh, one simple heuristic is that uh, it's a general heuristic for neural networks uh, that uh, neural networks tend to, to compress information from the input towards the output. So one, one usual heuristic in this case as well is that you reduce to half uh, the size of the layer as you progress from the out input to the output. Any more questions? So thank you. Thank you very much. The next talk will be on Modal, a modular active learning framework for Python. Hello. Okay. Can you hear me? My name is Theodor Danka. I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak here, and I'm going to, to talk to you about Modal, which is a modular active learning framework which I, I developed. So first, a uh, little bit about me. So I did my PhD in pure mathematics, like uh, mathematical physics, completely different stuff. And then from 2017, I, I switched, switched fields, and I started to work in a computational biology group called, called Biomag which is a biogenesis and machine learning group. I, I work at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. And basically, my, my job is to, to build interfaces between doctors and computers. And I'm going to shortly tell you what is active learning and what is model and why it is actually useful if you have active learning problems. So active learning problem is suppose that you have like a training data set for a classification problem, very simple, two classes blue and red, cancer cell, healthy cell, any, anything, it can be anything. So you can train a classifier on this training data set. And after you train this classifier, you have classification probabilities for, for each point in your feature space. If you have like certain classifier, for instance, random forest. So in the blue region, you are quite certain about the, the 
labor predictions. In this red, reg red region, you are also quite certain about your labor predictions, but in the middle, you have no information. Active learning comes into the picture when you actually have a lot more unlabeled data which you can exploit. So suppose you can pick a point here and ask some, some oracle for labels, for instance. Is it, is, it a, is it a negative tweet or a positive tweet? Is this cell healthy? Is this, is this patient healthy? Does, it, does he have cancer? So basically, it matters which point you select for labeling. So if you, if you pick this point here, it's not that informative because in this region you have quite high certainty about your predictions. But in this, this middle region, you basically have no, no information whatsoever, so you should pick this point. And active learning is a collection of strategies to actually help you ask the question about which data point, which unlabeled data point you, you want to label. So from, from, a, from a bird's view, active learning is basically you gather data, you, you build a model, and if you have a lots of unlabeled samples, you can measure the utility of each <coughs> sample, ask questions about labels, and then you can query for labels for an oracle. So this in the middle is called an active learning loop. And, and the problem is, is that you actually have dozens of methods for, for each of these steps. So you can build any classifier. You can have, you, you have several methods for measuring the, the utility, which is basically measuring the informativeness. And you have like also dozens of ways to select how, select which uh, sample you want to, to ask questions about. So in, in most active learning frameworks, this whole pipeline is, is thought of as an active learning algorithm. So if you, if you want to use an active learning framework for Python, you, you actually have like hard-coded hard -coded, uh, classifiers, hard-coded uncertainty measures. So what you actually need if you want to do active learning effectively and if you want to, to make it easy is like a, like a framework which has like a simple and unified API it's modular and flexible. It's easily extensible, so, so the pipeline is not hard-coded. You can easily replace components, and if you have like your own classifier, you can insert it easily. Easy to use and compatible with scikit-learn, because many models are in scikit-learn. So this is the, the most popular, one of the most popular machine learning packages for, for Python. And out of these requirements, model was born which is basically short for modular active learning framework, as I mentioned. And model is actually li like a word. It means structure as opposed to, to su substance. So this is exactly what this framework stands for. It, it doesn't matter what kind of classifier or, or query strategy you use. You can use all of them, and you can combine them however you want. So you can actually build active learning pipelines more easily. And if you are a researcher, you can, you can create your own classifiers and, and, and plug them in. So let's quickly review what I, what I mean about modularity. So using model is, is, is quite simple. You see, the main object is the active learner object. And upon initialization, you pass a classifier, you pass a, answer, pass a query strategy, and that's it. You are, you are ready to use. <laughs> and actually, the, the estimator can be any object which follows the scikit-learn API. And query strategy is any function which, which takes like, a, like an estimator object. And after you initialize this active learner, you basically have, have two methods which should, you should, should remember, the query method and the teach method. And this is as easy as it gets. So only one object which you have to work with. You don't have several objects. The, the data is in NumPy array formats. So it's, it follows the scikit-learn conventions. And actually, this is basically also, also very, very, how to say, uniform. Because, because with almost minimal changes, you can experiment with very different active learning algorithms. So it's good for prototyping and good for, for research. 
So basically what I mean when I, when I say it's flexible. So you, you can put any, any model in here and it will work. So you, you can put a classif classifier, a regressor, or if you have like a, like a deep learning model for, from Keras, you can even put a deep learning model there and it will work. As far as I know, this is the, this is the only active learning framework which supports deep learning models. And, and if you have these, these three very different active learning algorithms, how you use them is the same. So you use them with the same, same methods. So basically, it's quite flexible. And also one, one of the main requirements which I had when I, I, I developed it is that if you, if you want to actually create active learning strategies, so if you are a researcher, it's supposed to be easy for you to implement a query strategy and plug this into any pipeline and test it quickly. So basically, if you, if you have like a query strategy in mind, you just write a function, pass it to the active learner object upon initialization, and it will work perfectly. So you, you don't need to, to implement classes which inherit from other classes. So no, no complications, just a simple function will do it. So actually, the, the active learner objects are acting like a scikit learn estimator. So they have the same API. You can, you can plug them into to scikit learn pipelines, for instance, cross validation score. And some additional features which model has is Keras support, PyTorch support. So you can, as I mentioned, use deep learning models. It also supports regression. It also supports ensemble models, where you, 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 you do not only have one classifier, but you have like several classifiers, each of them having like, like different conclusions about your, your feature space. And you can basically ask them questions about your data. And what to do in, in the future is I would like to optimize the code thoroughly. And I have actually learned quite a lot during the tutorials yesterday and day before, so I'm going to employ these strategies in this, this uh, point. I would also like to, to implement query synthesis, which is similar to, to like GUN. You actually don't, don't have unlabeled data, but you generate unlabeled data from, from what your classifier thinks about the hypothesis space. And also, like, it can also do Bayesian optimization I don't know if you have heard about Bayesian optimization, but basically it's like an optimization method for functions which are very expensive to evaluate. So this also follows this classical active learning loop. And you can also do Bayesian optimization, for instance. You can use it for hyperparameter tuning for, for your, your classifier. And it's, it's game over for me. So I actually finished. So contributions are welcome. It's, it's open, hosted on GitHub. So far, it's a one-man project, but I, I happy to accept pull requests and features. And one one last comment is that if you want a, a cool model laptop sticker, you can you can just grab one from here. And thank you very much for your attention. Questions. Hi. Um, how at the beginning your input data had like a nice two D kind of input space. Um, yeah. How many dimensions of input space um, have Not you ha tried? How many dimensions I have tried? I mean, in, in practice, in, in practice, you, you, you can also work with images also, which is like. Not a vector, but 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 a matrix. So you can you can also do that. It's not restricted to one-dimensional arrays. It's because yeah. If if you do like convolutional neural networks, you traditionally work with images. It works with model also. So okay. that works as well. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, 
How would you add some feature engineering maybe uh, uh, into the pipeline of your uh, mod L uh, library? So for example, when I um, realize that some feature probably missing, I um, maybe can add some product of two features or some something else. Can you like elaborate there here like um, advice maybe? with the library how do i do feature engineering i mean uh, i mean it's easy to replace uh, a classifier or um, a regressor here so when when we call teach right yeah uh, but sometimes what we need is to actually add a new feature or, or or a new feature column can we catch up here something that problem is actually something which i have never th never thought about but this is a good point so Probably I would like build a new classifier from scratch, but but actually the the previous data which you used are, are are known for you. So so maybe you can you, you can extract that. The active learning object keeps track of that, and maybe you can use it for for I don't know putting in features. This 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 is not something which I, I have much experience in. So maybe okay, we, can, we can talk later about this. Yes, of course we should. Yes. Any more questions? Um, have you integrated it like in a loop for users that makes it very convenient to use, or do you can you recommend other packages that you can use around this to really have like a you know like a user interface where somebody like the model is trained in the background and the user really just gets new images, writes a label, and it's redoing everything? It's it's in in progress. I mean, I, I should have included it into the to do list. So basically, if I understand your 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 question correctly is that this, this labeling is, is up to the user at this point. And what, what, what I have in mind is actually like building a web API, a web API for, for you know, putting your unlabeled data and it, it will display your, your image and you, you can just have a way to, to input the label. It's, it's in, in, in progress. I mean, o on the long run, it will, the model will actually be part of a, of a cell phenotyping package for, for cell biologists and doctors. So they, they do not like to use APIs, like as scikit-learn, but they do like to have these interactive browser-based tools which are uh, enabling them to label easily. So this is, this is in, in progress. So thank you. Thank you very much. The next stack will be Imbalance Learn, a scikit learn contrib to tackle learning from imbalance data set by Guillermo Lamaitre. I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. No. It's OK, no worry. Guillaume The microphone is working? Yeah? OK, great. Thanks. So I will present myself. So I'm Guillaume Lemaitre. I'm working at INRIA Paris. Uh, I'm part of the core developers from Scikit-Learns. So today, I will not present Scikit-Learns. I will present another data set which I developed during my PhD, and that now is a bit boring with some stuff around it. And it's called Imbalance Learn. And uh, I will have two parts of the talk. One part of the talk that will explain what is the problem of balancing and what you have, for instance, in scikit-learn to try to have some estimator to learn it, uh, I mean, to learn some models. And the second part, which is more 
what we came that you didn't have yet in scikit-learn, okay? And I will spend a bit more time on imbalance learn. So, imbalance data set, what does it look like? And I will give a couple of, of examples. So my PhD was on detecting or segmenting cancer in, uh, in MRI images, so for prostate cancer. So for instance here, you have the prostate around here, and you have a cancer which is delimited by the blue line, and then you want to have like a probability map that you will tag every pixels. The issues is you have a lot of voxels. A lot of voxels will not be, will be health fit issues, and you have only, usually, because you want to detect the cancer at the beginning, okay, not one that is, one that is taking the full image, you will have only few voxels that will be actually labeled as cancerous. So if you want to have a machine learning models, then you will have like a high quantity of sample that will be from one class and a small quantity of sample that will be on the other class and more or less the class of interest, okay? So other things is now we are working in Paris on, on some physics prem which is called like solar wind. So you have explosion on the sun and then you have waves. But usually what you are recording is like you are recording events which are nothing, and suddenly you have a short period of time where you have those solar wind which are coming, and you would like to detect them. But in the time series, you have much more things that you are not interested in, in it, and a lot, and a small portion which you are interested in. So for instance, in that case, you have like 26 over one, which is a ratio, which is, was 20 over one for the prostate cancers. And you have other cases like, for instance, uh, it's one of the cases that I was working like in an example that I will present at the end on a car uh, insurance claim. So to know if a, a user will just uh, make a claim for the insurance and usually people doesn't have any prem with the car. So you have much more people that doesn't have prems than people that have prems. And when you want to predict those, you have again a prem of imbalance sets. And what you would like is to be able to predict I mean, to have a classifier model that doesn't make a bias towards one of the class or not. So what exactly is the issue? So the issue is the following. It's that let's start with a small data set where I have some yellow points here and then some other points here. So I have two class, OK? And the issue will be that uh, one of the class will be underrepresented compared to the other class. And here I have different ratio. Okay, so here is highly imbalanced, and here this is uh, equally balanced. And actually, if you just use a simple SVM with uh, RBF kernels, what you will see is that when you, the case that you are completely balanced, you will be able to have a good AUC, and the classifier will be able to actually fit the data. But when you go to degenerate cases, then you will have a very low AUC because the classifier will just <laughs> take into account the majority class, OK? So now is how can I basically tackle these problems, OK? So it depends. You have several solutions. And here I will not only focus on the one that we do in the imbalance room. I will first show what we have in scikit-learn to do that. And then I will present the solution that we have in, in the imbalance run. So you have three ways. And the first way is unsupervised learning. So you could say, OK, I have my data. And actually, the class which, is my, um, which have like uh, uh, some uh, is in minority will be actually outliers. So I could have an outlier detection algorithm, which is completely unsupervised. I give all my data, and I tell him, OK, Find me on one side the outliers, and the other class will be the majority class. So you have several methods that can do that in scikit-learn, as uh, ellip elliptical, uh, elliptic envelopes, assertion forest, local outliers. One class SVM can be used for that, but usually this is not the right case. We'll see in the second step. Uh, and then you just have to fit fit on x and predict on x. So you don't need any label or any information about why, OK? Any uh, target information. And when you do that, you will get something like this one. So for instance, we are able to much better predict 
uh, in the case that, so here is the case that we have the maximum, so 16 over 1 ratio. So we have only 5% of the minority class, okay? And in that case, we can actually be able to feed this, okay? So you can do it in completely unsupervised way. The other way of doing it is a semi-supervised. So let's say that it's time consuming sometimes to uh, just label data. So what you could do is say, seeing that it is, I can have a lot of majority case that I'm sure about it, but I don't want to search for the minority case. I will just learn what is the typical things about these majority things, and whatsoever doesn't look like this will be actually an outliers, will be my overclass. So it's what is called novelty detections, okay? So, and one of the typical algorithms for that is, right now in, in Cyclone is one class SVM. So I can just, so I split here in test train, but I just keep the one of the class, so the sample of the majority, which I will just fit, and then I will predict on the full data sets, and I will get something like this, okay? So I'm able to find my majority class and my minority class will be well predicted as well, okay? Because it will be detected as new thing that doesn't follow what I saw during the training, okay? So for the moment we saw unsupervised, semi-supervised, and the other way that you can do is supervised learning, okay? So it's where imbalance learning is it's coming. So in that case, uh, what you are doing is taking the full data sets and just resample either the majority class or either the minority class. So to do that, you just create a pipeline where you put your samplers and you fit, and then you will predict. And during the training here, the, the sampler will make just a resampling, okay? So we have different methods. You can do it either with some undersampling methods or oversampling and you can also play with the ratio, and then you will have different uh, balancing there. So what scikit-learn offers? So I'm a bit of time. So usually what's happening is that in scikit-learn, you can either sample the columns, or you can also rescale the data, but you can never sample rows, OK? So what imbalance, imbalance learn propose is to actually uh, I will switch here. So it's to actually sample rows so that you can learn with different rows. So how does it work? You have a sample strategy where you can actually give the ratio that you want, okay? And then you will be able to, uh, to, to balance with a given ratio. So you can try dif different things there. So we have different methods which can be tested. Uh, so usually the one which are known in oversampling are smoths, and the one are just undersampling methods. Uh, and you can also combine oversampling and undersampling. And then you have the pipeline. So you usually use it within a pipeline like this. You don't have to know how to. So it will just for you resample during fitting and not during predict times. And we have a couple of other things that are ag aggregated to scikit learn. So we have some new type of measure that are good for imbalanced uh, statistics, as well as some uh, like uh, toy data sets. So we have a new version that will come, uh, which is 04, that will come when uh, scikit learn is arriving with 020. Okay? So we have a couple of new estimators to do that, but more interestingly, we just uh, put something which is uh, uh, compatible with Keras and TensorFlow that allow you to, uh, when you do mini batches, that can uh, actually sample your mini batches. So you just have to create a generators, and then you pass the generator to feed generators, and like this, at every, uh, during the, the fitting, we'll just like balance also the, the batches, and that will allow to go uh, faster. And I think this is my last slide. So you can install it with PIP, or we have also a package on Quantum Forge. OK? And then we have other things that will come. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hi. So I was just wondering, uh, why don't you um, take your majority class and train an autoencoder on it, and then 
you can use the, the Santo echo there to um, decide whether it is majority or minority. Um, I mean, that's a kind of, of thing that you can do probably if you work in the deep learning frameworks. Uh, the methods which are implemented here are coming from the literature. So uh, let's say that they are the state of the arts. Then now with deep learning, you can do a one out encoder if you want. I mean, the, it's not implemented there, but I think that you can do a general like uh, Keras one and just integrate it inside the cyclone pipeline. I mean, that's another way of doing it. Okay, thank you. Maybe we will discuss later. Okay. Um, are all, all the um, learning models affected by imbalanced data or only some? Because you mentioned SVM, and uh, so I know the situation is quite mixed. And is, can, you, can you also address a clear separation where this problem is important and in which is it is already handled by the model itself? So you have, uh, so for instance, the trees will be affected about it. So whatever, run of uh, gradient boosting, because uh, the, so for instance, classification, uh, in classification, because uh, the gene index, for instance, is one index that will be affected by just the difference of classes. So there you will have a problem. And the things that more disease imbalanced, and usually is when you have drastic uh, balance ratio, that that will be an issue. If you have, I mean, uh, just like uh, uh, just half of the samples, I mean, you have like a, a low imbalance ratio, you will not maybe get any trouble, okay? So it's really in, in high uh, imbalance ratio that we, you will have issues. And then I assume that you have, I mean, you will have a lot of models that will be affected by that, not only uh, the SVM, but logistic regressions and, and all the linear classifier. Okay, thank you. Any, any more questions? So, well, since you're running out of time, I think this is the last question we'll take. Feature selection with imbalanced data. Do you have any solution in your package? So feature, so we do sample selection, not You feature. do feature selection, so you have a larger number of features. You want to select the best ones to predict your problem, which is imbalanced. So you can, so for us, we don't do the feature selection, but you can use Scikit-Learn for that, where you have uh, feature selections inside. Mm -hmm. And if you have imbalance plus the feature selection program, you can always have a sampler plus a feature selection okay. where you pipeline the things together. Perfect. So you put the feature selection after, after the you have uh, the modified balancing. your rows. Yeah, because like this, the l because sometimes you can make feature selection using actually an estimator. Mm -hmm. So when you want to train this estimator, you don't want that is biased. So you will just first make the sampling and then the selection of the features. Perfect. Thank you. Last question. Is it possible to use this method uh, to uh, not to uh, oversample or undersample according to your uh, target variable, but according to, for instance, uh, one hot uh, encoded variable, input variable? So actually this is possible because we have something that is called, I didn't have time, but it's a function sampler. Ah. You define you the heuristic inside the function, you pass it to the sampler, and then this will allow you to, to do use the sampling that you want with the heuristic that you want, okay? So it's not only, Constant. the common one are, are those one, but then you can define your own. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Next talk will be on efficient biomedical named entity recognition in Python by Tilia Ellendorf. Okay, for some reason I only see the slides here and not on my laptop, which might be a problem. No, I don't see anything. Okay. Um, let's move.
it's weird. Can someone know Mac? Uh, yeah, does somebody Mac know? Huh? Do you know how to make it possible to see the slides on the laptop? Anybody? Okay, well, I will just try like this. There will be some demonstration later. I hope I will manage with that. Um, but yeah, there's not so much time, so let's just get started. So um, maybe a few words about myself. My name is Tilia Ellendorf. I'm doing a PhD at the University of Zurich in biomedical text mining. And um, this is actually some work done by my colleagues. So initially, and I was not even um, going to present it, but somebody else was going to be here. But now I'm stepping in, and I hope I will do my best. And this shouldn't discourage you from asking any questions if you have questions. Um, yeah, I should also be able to answer them. So the topic of the um, talk is a, a biomedical entity recognition. Who of you is familiar with this topic? OK, nobody. So I will go a bit more into detail about the motivation. Then I will um, presen present the tool and give a quick demonstration of the code um, and how the tool works, um, which ho hopefully will work out. But let's see. So the motivation is that in biomedical um, text mining, you want to, to you, you want to do named entity recognition. Um, what does this mean? Um, you have a text, for example, the text of a research paper from the biomedical domain. And in this um, text, you just want to find all the references to entities. Um, entity you have different entity types, for example, disease or diseases might be an entity type. And you want to find all strands in the text that correspond to this entity type. Um, I think this gives a good overview. Um, then if you, when you have found these entity types, you want to um, annotate the entities. So you have a new format where you know where all the entities are in the text. Additionally, you want to do something that is called concept recognition. Um, and other names for the same thing are entity linking, normalization, or grounding. And this just means that, um, well, this is not very easy to see, but you just want to um, assign database identifiers from some biomedical database to the spans in the text. So you can have different um, ontologies or taxonomies. Um, like for, for here, for example, you have the gene ontology or the NCBI taxonomy. People f of you who work in bio, um, biology will be familiar with this probably. And you want to know which spans of the text take which identifier. Um, so the tool that we use for doing this um, is called OGA. This stands for the Ontogene Entity Recognizer. Ontogene is the name of the research group and um, entity recognizer because that's what it does. It's obviously written in Python, that's why I'm presenting it here. And um, it supports a wide range of input and output formats, like typical input would be plain text, um, PubMed, PMC, XML, which you can get from the NCBI or NLM um, interface. BioC is a standard format for biomedical text mining. Um, and then some other an annotation format in JSON. OK, this is not so easy to see. I used this tool where you can transform your Jupyter notebooks into slides. On my desktop, it looked better. But I hope <laughs> it is still visible. So this is how, how it works, basically. First step, um, there's some step one written there, which is not visible anymore. But first step is you have a dictionary lookup, um, which just takes the documents from PubMed or Pub PMC, um, applies the lookup. And um, you get some annotated documents, which have all possible entity candidates marked. Um, and then you want to decide which entities um, you have there exactly. Because you have a whole list of entity candidates, there's some ambigu ambiguity, and you want to decide which entity candidates you want to keep. And this is what the second step is for. I'm going to say a bit more um, about that in detail in a moment. So the dictionary lookup, you have um, a tool that we also developed. It's called BioTermHub. And uh, this is an interface 
where you can um, on our servers where you can um, choose your specific dictionary for your specific application so you can decide which ontologies taxonomies you want to include to build the dictionary it's very easy it's in TSV format so a spreadsheet format and um, you can export it and you can um, use it in your pipeline um, the lookup algorithm is very efficient so my colleague programmed it in, in a way that it can process a lot of documents in a short time, which is necessary in biomedical text mining because you might want to process millions of documents and if you have to wait a long time, um, it might not even be possible. Um, <coughs> so I wanted to show a demonstration of this, which is not easy now because I can't see where I am, but maybe I can do it like this. Well, Biotherm Hub, um, you see in this image you have different ontologies, taxonomies, you uh, might recognize some of them. And um, the term hub just combines everything into one dictionary. Let's see if I can show that here. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, you can select um, from a range of difficult, uh, different uh, possibilities. And um, if, it, if you see um, that there's an update button, you can um, update the version of the resource that is on our servers so that you're sure that you always have the current version of the resource. Um, then you can download it far down. Or you can also still do some other things. You can do some renaming of the resources. If in your output you prefer to have a different name, um, for example, if you have um, mesh for organisms, you can also just rename it to organisms, depending of, of on what you want to do. Um, then you can download it. Okay, I will go back to the presentation. Uh, okay. Now, um, a few more words about the lookup algorithm. It's um, very efficient because it uses two kind of kinds of index indices: a trigger index, which for each word just checks if it might be the first word, if it is the first word of any entity that you have in your dictionary, and only if that applies, you go to the main index, which has um, the length of the different entities that might be at that position, because every entity candidate can have more than one tokens that means it is it can be more than one word long so you don't know like where to stop and um, this checks for exactly the length that is needed and if it finds the candidate then it assigns all the informations in the dictionary like for example the id of the entity to the candidate and um, my colleague who um, developed this he um, won a challenge, which is called the TIPS challenge of BioCreative, a shared, a shared task in the biomedical in the domain of biomedical text mining, because it was the fastest system. Then the second step is a disambiguation post filter, which is a, which actually does the following: um, for each span in the text, the dictionary can assign different um, possibilities, like which entity type it might be. And this post filter just did, um, uses a neural network to decide um, which entity types it wants to keep at this position. Um, for this, it uses only the output of the dictionary lookup. It does some feature extractions, which I'm not going to describe in detail here, but if you have further questions about it, you can come to me after the presentation. Um, but basically, it uses the context of the words of the of the candidates in the text, um, it has w just one hidden layer and then a soft max output output layer, which makes the final decision. And it keeps the two most likely candidates. One one possibility is also that it decides that it doesn't want to keep anything. In that case, it deletes the annotation. Um, the tool runs as a web service. Uh, it you you can give an ID like a PubMed ID, then it downloads it from um, from the internet and processes it processes it, 
or you can also upload some text and then it processes the text and it gives you it applies all the steps the annotators are the different entity types so each entity type that you might want to use has an annotator it sends it through the post filter and it gives you the response in an, a format which is an XML format where well you can choose it but it has all the the annotations that the annotator finds um, I was going to demonstrate that but maybe I just go to the um, well there's a there should be a link but now it's cut so I'm just going to show how to use it as a library there's some code on github if you want to try it out you can find it here um, okay this is also cut off but I will still run it so you have two main components that are needed a router and a pipeline server the router is the, um, takes care of the control structure of the pipeline it handles the configuration and the pipeline server server organizes the text processing and the entity recognition and input output so let's run this okay for some reason on my computer it worked before and now it doesn't work here Then you can lo load a text file that you might have on, on your computer. And you get one um, article, what maybe I said, you get one article um, back. You can look at the text of the document. You can load a collection of several documents. Okay, this takes a bit longer now. And actually, I have already game over, so maybe I will just skip forward quickly. Um, you can get text from different documents in the collection from different sections in the document and you can apply the entity recognition you can get different um, attributes of the entities and the info of the entity but because I'm, ru I'm running out of time you will have to try that by yourself okay that's it thank you questions I have no questions. Thank. I think it's a bit of an understanding question, and like how how you see this fit in to the scientific environment. So uh, basically, it's also available as a library, so I don't have to depend on your servers. I can run it locally. Yes, this I was running it locally now. Well, uh, and you see, you see this as a tool which could be used to help people do literature research. Um, yes, and um, if you want, you could also adapt it to your own problem. It's not necessarily restricted to biomedical text mining. Okay. If you have a text, you want to find some spans in the text that are part of a dictionary, you could also possibly apply it. So it doesn't have any sort of biomedical priors, which would... Well, um, the way that it downloads the documents directly from PubMed, that's, of course, um, like related to this problem. But I think it wouldn't be so hard to change it to adapt it to your specific problem. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Our next talk will be going full Python for machine learning and biomedical engineering by Jeremy Lafore.
Okay. Okay, well, that will do. I don't know why it doesn't want to get rid of the machine. So, um, sorry for the cropped presentation. Um, first, a small disclaimer. I will be mainly talking about the why, not the how we are doing that. Uh, so, a little bit of introduction. Then I will quickly talk about a model we built before and then go into what does that mean for machine learning, the kind of things we are working on. Uh, so I'm a research engineer at uh, UTC in uh, France, so a bit north of Paris. Uh, most of my education was in physics and robotics. I did my PhD in Montpellier on smooth muscle modeling, so a bit different. And I've been doing Python for a decade now. And now I'm mostly working on muscle modeling, uh, both skeletal and striated and smooth muscle. Uh, and how can we implement and simulate these models efficiently? Um, in our lab, when I arrived in 2010-2011, they didn't know about Python. So I just said, okay, we'll do that from now for the models, and they trust me. And now, th as you see, the idea is that all our models are fully written in Python, or uh, graphical interface and visualiza visualization tools are in Python too. And I even managed to get them to start moving signal processing things to Python. And when the question to do machine learning arise, it's OK, we'll do Python. And why did I achieve, achieve that? Well, mainly because of the successful development of um, multi-physics skeletal model which was done within one PhD. Um, so our main idea is that when we build model, we want them to be physiologically meaningful. So all the parameters, the input, the output, should mean something. Uh, we usually buy, build multi-scale models, so from cell to organ, when it, uh, it's necessary. Uh, we, are going, we were first doing only electrophysiology, so the electrical signal from the biological systems. Uh, but as time goes, we see that we need to add even more things, so chemistry, mechanics, and so on. And in terms of implementation, we try to only use free software to ch share code between our models. And uh, we have some object-oriented uh, approach for um, extendability. Unfortunately, most of the models are still closed source at the time. And the model we built was that. So we start from all the neural systems pilot the muscle, uh, or we generate on one side the electrical signal from that muscle and the mechanical activity, and we merge the two of them. So I'm going very quickly around it. Uh, and the thing is that with that, we can answer a lot of questions, but that will be for next year and another talk. Uh, just a little bit on the um, technical details. So it's developed in Python 3. It's object-oriented, as I said. Uh, we even have some parallel computings in that. So I will talk a, a little bit about that. Uh, it uses JSON as an input file. And as you can barely see on the right, uh, we have some visualization tools and simulation management things that are pretty neat. Uh, and one good thing is that with that, we could play around with our computation time. So at first, we used uh, a source for the model at the, fib at the muscle fiber scale, so very thin, uh, small sources. Um, and the problem was computation time. As you can see, if you use just one CPU, it takes a few days to get your simulation. Uh, given all these sources are independent, it was quite natural just to parallelize everything. So if you 
use 10 CPUs, it's more or less divided by 10. Good. Uh, and then we went further profiling and playing around, and we realized that, OK, the problem is really the source computation. We have just too many sources. Uh, your typical muscle would be hundreds of thousands of fibers. So that's hundreds of thousands of sources that you have to consider. But these sources are grouped into motor units. And these motor units, you have only a few hundreds of them. So we said, uh, couldn't we build our sources at the motor unit scale? And surprisingly, it was quite easy. And we managed to do that. And then you can see that now we can have your simulation in half an hour with just one CPU. And this result were quite impressive for my coworkers. So they say, OK, now we trust you. That's a good idea to use Python. <laughs> Uh, so, what we are focusing on at the moment is uh, working on neuromuscular aging. So we know that muscle degenerate with aging, but it's little known at which rate for people and which factor will influence it. And so far, the test done by the medical practitioner would be like the one presented, it, a stand-up test. So you stand up, you walk three meters, you come back, you sit down and they time it, and that's it. That's not really precise. That depends a bit of the, uh, of the people measuring, because if you have an elderly people w um, standing up slowly, it's not really easy to see when is the actual start. So it's quite um, subjective as a measurement. So our idea is to build a system that will do objective measurements. Uh, for that, we use uh, HD SEMG, so a lot of channels of electromyogram, so recording the electrical activity of the muscle at the skin surface, on the quadriceps, during that kind of daily movement. Uh, we also record at the same time the trunk acceleration to get an idea of the movement, especially when standing up. And now the idea is to combine everything from that with machine learning and to score or aging. Well, as we probably will see more tomorrow in the keynote, uh, biomedical data, it's a bit special. It's particularly expensive. I mean, if you want to record one new point, that will be a mess. <laughs> uh, especially uh, when we are working with elderly people there, but we are also working on pregnant women on another project. Uh, the ethical procedures are long. It can take up to a year to have your agreement uh, just to be to this kind of recording. So you're just putting electrodes on the people, recording, not doing anything invasive. Um, it's then hard to get people to actually participate in the test, because you have to find elderly people that understand what you are doing and want to help you. And also, we have to fit this protocol inside the hospital routines. So it doesn't take too much time. So we have people able to, um, to run them. But on the other side, what we get is a lot of things. As I said, we use up from 64 to 200 uh, six, um, channels at 4 kHz. Uh, we have spatiotemporal data on the activation of the muscle. On that, you can extract tens of features from uh, very different uh, aspects. You have the accelerometry data. So we have a few subjects, but we can get a lot of things from each point. Uh, and we have also more constraints on the algorithm we want to use. So our data, our algorithm must be very robust because our data are sensitive to experimental condition. For example, if you misplace slightly the electrode grids I show you, you will have different information. Uh, you also have a lot of variability between subjects, but also with the same subject. If you do two measurements in a row, you will have fatigue, you will have different, uh, uh, the brain will recruit the muscle slightly differently. So two data aren't the same. Uh, of course, accuracy will be a critical problem. We want to help diagnosis. So I can, you can see what's the, the point there. Uh, it's also tricky to supervise this kind of algorithm, because most of the time, you don't have 
uh, really well-defined labels. If you ask two doctors, they might not always agree on which label to put. Um, of course, we want to use all the computational power we can get. And last but not least, in the end, we want to put this system in the end of the doctors. So it has to be quite simple to use. Uh, so why are we choosing Python to do all of that? Well, because we know that we will need to test and prototype a lot of methods. And well, we have all we need. We have SciPy for all the signal processing, scikit-learn and other tools for machine learning. Uh, as we know, we'll have to develop a web service of GUI. Well, we have Matplotlib, Seaborn, PyQt, Django, and many others. Uh, for the computational powers, we have CProfile to get to know where it's, uh, where are the bottlenecks, uh, Numba, Dask, and even even the deep learning things are using GPUs. So, at the end, it's one language to rule them all. And the good thing is that it's easy to learn for our new people. And if, as we use the same language for everything, it's easier for me to maintain the code base and fix bugs afterwards. And now it's time to get the work done. So right now, it's this I was showing. Uh, we are working mainly on the recording device and the machine learning prototyping. And the next step in the future would be to integrate the model predictions in that framework. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, you mentioned in the beginning that um, everything has to be physiologically interpretable. Yeah. Does that, is that for ethical and accountability concerns? And uh, uh, does it constrain the models you can use? It does happen on that. And also, um, in the models, one thing we want to go in the end is a personalized model. And then, if you can say that the models differ from that patient or that patient on this specific thing, and you can say to the doctor, yeah, that's the muscle mass, which is different, or the conduction velocity. They can use that information in their di diagnosis. Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Any more questions? Yes, that's it. Thank you. You're welcome.